for this entry in the Disney Villains Retrospective, we're returning to the world of fairy tales. The story of Cinderella reportedly has thousands of variations, and its origins span centuries. For the sake of this video, the versions I'll be covering for the source material are the Charles Perrault version from 1697 and the Brothers Grimm version from 1812, which have the most conventions that are expected from the classic story. They are also the versions the Disney movie borrows the most from. In the Peralt version of the story, a young girl's widowed father marries a haughty woman with two equally haughty daughters. The stepmother forces the girl to work day and night, jealous that her natural beauty outshines that of her own children. The girl is covered in soot and cinders from working, and is mockingly called Cinderwench by everyone, except for the younger, ever so slightly nicer stepdaughter, who calls her Cinderella instead. When a grand ball is held by the prince, the stepdaughters go, leaving Cinderella behind. Her fairy godmother magically grants her a coach, a dress, and glass slippers, allowing her to make a grand entrance. The spell lasts until midnight, so Cinderella needs to make a quick exit. The next night, a second ball is held. Once again, Cinderella runs out at midnight, this time accidentally leaving a slipper behind. The prince searches the kingdom for the owner of the slipper, which of course fits Cinderella. Her stepsisters beg her for forgiveness. Virtuous Cinderella not only forgives them, but also lets them live in the castle with her and finds them rich suitors. The Brothers Grimm version is considerably darker. In this one, Cinderella's stepmother promises that she may go to the king's festival if she does all her chores, but the chores she delegates are nearly impossible. A flock of birds helps Cinderella complete the tasks, but the stepmother leaves her behind anyway. Cinderella does not have a fairy godmother, but instead receives the dress and slippers from an enchanted tree that is blessed by the spirit of her late mother. When the stepsisters try on the slippers, they actually cut off parts of their feet, a toe for one, a heel for the other, to make it fit properly. The birds point out the trail of blood they're leaving, revealing their deceit. When the stepsisters crash Cinderella's wedding, the birds peck their eyes out, blinding them. In both versions, the stepsisters have a larger presence than the stepmother. In fact, the stepmother is only mentioned in the first two paragraphs of the Peralt version, with the stepsisters doing everything else. Peralt is much more merciful to the sisters, allowing them to get a very happy ending themselves. I don't think they quite deserve that level of happiness, at least not immediately, but I also don't think they totally deserve the mutilation the Grimm brothers gave them. I'll give points to the Grimms, though. It's certainly memorable. Disturbingly, Cinderella's father is present throughout both stories, and just sort of lets his new wife torment his daughter. I feel that if anyone deserves the Hitchcock bird treatment, it would be him and the stepmother. Disney's history with Cinderella goes very far back, all the way back to Walt's earliest cartoons, even predating characters like Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and Alice from the Alice comedies. Disney did a series of cartoons called Laugh-O-Grams, all spoofing fairy tales. In 1922, he adapted Cinderella, setting it in contemporary times. Cinderella's stepmother does not appear, but her two stepsisters do, described as lazy and homely. It's difficult to say just how homely they really are, given the simplistic art style of the cartoon. There's not too much to say about the stepsisters or the cartoon as a whole, other than how mind-blowing it is to compare such a primitive work to Disney's later output, even ten years after this. It really shows how dedicated Walt was to improving and perfecting his craft. Speaking of ten years later, give or take a year, in 1933, Disney considered doing a more elaborate take on Cinderella as a silly symphony. The smash success of The Three Little Pigs that year had shown the great potential in these kinds of adaptations. Many sketches for gags revolving around the Step family were submitted. They involved the women gussing themselves up for the ball, them attempting to hide Cinderella from the prince when the slipper is being brought to their house, and of course gags of the sisters unsuccessfully trying on the slipper. For one reason or another, the short was never made. No official reason has been found, but some speculate it was because of Walt's decision the following year to focus on making Snow White as his first full-length film. I wonder myself if it was cancelled because of the Fleischer Studios releasing their own Cinderella adaptation in 1934 starring Betty Boop. Either way, a few of the proposed gags with the stepsisters struggling to shove their feet into the glass slipper wound up being used in the eventual full-length Cinderella that Disney made in 1950. Oh yes, 1950. A difficult time for the studio. As I detailed in the previous entries, Disney was facing financial troubles. A good deal of their setbacks had been due to World War II, but even then, their only two animated films to turn a good profit had been Snow White and Dumbo. The expensive Fantasia and Bambi had especially been flops, 
Since audiences didn't know what to make of the experimental Fantasia, and Bambi was seen as a little too dark and somber during the war. Walt knew that if their next movie wasn't an absolute hit, they would have to pull the plug on feature-length animation. And so, perhaps remembering the success of Snow White, he chose to adapt another classic princess fairy tale, something the audiences were already familiar with. Cinderella, to some extent, uses a lot of the same plot devices as Snow White. A beautiful heroine forced to dress in rags and toil, a handsome prince who is more of a plot device than a character, a group of comic relief sidekicks who have extended comedy scenes, and a tall, sinister, jealous villainess. Enter Lady Tremaine. Lady Tremaine is one of Disney's best villains from a creative standpoint, because she's so real. A lot of the bad guys that we've seen thus far, and will continue to see, have a sort of larger-than-life aspect about them. They're royalty and command a squadron of guards, they have magic powers, they're wild and comical, they're physically strong. Lady Tremaine has none of these things, but she's an everyday evil. She's an abuser. She's in a position of power over someone else, and she uses that power to make that person's life miserable because of her own internal issues and shortcomings. She's a very realistic kind of evil, and often that's the scariest kind of evil there is. Tremaine is a social climber, obsessed with furthering her position in high society. Her own daughters are kind of a mess, thanks to her poor parenting, and rather than help them develop as individuals, she focuses on building them up by superficial means, like fancy clothes and music lessons, which ultimately bankrupts the family. No amount of nice clothes or makeup can make her daughters any better in the long run, yet Lady Tremaine is too haughty and conceited to admit this. Cinderella, meanwhile, is not only beautiful outside, but also inside, which earns her double the scorn from her wicked stepmother. The scenes between these two characters are tense and well-directed. The power dynamic is well established in their first interaction we see, with Tremaine sitting in the darkness of her bedroom, stroking her cat like a James Bond villain. Cinderella stands powerless before her, the shadows on the wall looking like prison bars. Even as a child, I remember this scene making me feel very nervous and on edge. Although I said that this movie definitely lifts aspects from Snow White, I'd say the relationship between the stepmother and daughter is much stronger here, since we actually see the characters interact in their day-to-day -day lives. In Snow White, we only see her and the Queen together when the Queen is disguised as the old lady. Snow White obviously doesn't recognize her, and their dynamics are naturally very different than how they normally would be, especially because the Queen has to pretend to be nice to her. Lady Tremaine only raises her voice when she needs to, which isn't that often. She is mostly rather soft-spoken and very subtle in how she moves and speaks. Unlike her clownish daughters, Lady Tremaine's mind is constantly moving, constantly calculating, and planning every action. Everything she does is completely deliberate, and the way that we see it reflected through her animation is brilliant. Some of the glares she gives with her piercing green eyes are enough to still give me shivers. Of course, her most frightening moment is where she follows Cinderella up the stairs, prepared to lock her in the tower. She's entirely silent, but absolutely furious. And of course, she cruelly trips the footman at the end, breaking the glass slipper. Her little smug smile says a thousand words. Of course, she doesn't know that the king will most likely kill the duke if he fails to find the mystery woman whose foot fits the slipper, but even if she did, she probably wouldn't care. Every eligible maiden is to attend. Why, that's us, and I'm so eligible. The two stepdaughters, Anastasia and Rosella, are largely used for comedic effect. There's virtually no difference between them. They're a pair of awkward young women who are always squabbling with each other, unless they have Cinderella to direct their anger at. In fact, the only time they actually appear as something more than clownish is when they tear up Cinderella's dress. It's a quick scene, but it's incredibly intense, and was downright traumatic for many who watched this movie as children. It's ultimately this moment that succeeds in truly breaking Cinderella's spirit. After that for the sisters, though, it's back to being broad caricatures and providing some more laughs. I must say, I like how they were handled artistically. In many Cinderella adaptations, especially illustrated or animated ones, the quote-unquote ugly stepsisters are drawn in a truly grotesque fashion. However, while the Disney versions are certainly not going to win any beauty contests, they're not hideous. Most of their ugliness comes from their actions rather than their appearance. Indeed, most of Anastasia and Rizal's purpose is to provide a stark contrast to Cinderella's natural beauty, grace, and charm. For example, while Drizello bellows out the song Sing Sweet Nightingale during music practice, 
Cinderella nonchalantly sings it to herself in the other room, sounding absolutely lovely. The stepsisters are hot-tempered, petty, and vindictive, while Cinderella is gentle and forgiving. They are clumsy, she is graceful. You can at least understand where some of the Tremaine's bitterness and jealousy arises from when comparing themselves to Cinderella, but that's of course no excuse for their wretched treatment of her, especially when Cinderella would be happy to act as a loving family to them, if they actually let her. One other major point of contrast is the animal friends. Cinderella has a slew of mice and birds along with a dog and horse who are all loyal and loving. Lady Tremaine only has her cat Lucifer, the poster kitten for evil cartoon feline. The Tremaines make Cinderella's life difficult because of their unresolved bitterness, Lucifer just does it for fun. Lucifer spends most of the movie chasing the poor mice around, especially Pudgy Gus. Although Lucifer is ultimately humiliated and outsmarted time and time again, he manages to remain menacing, since all the mice need to do is slip up once to end up as his prey. The mice know this all too well, based on Jack's reaction to being chosen to distract Lucifer in the morning. He's most likely done this countless times, but it seems to always end up being a close call, and any one of them could be his last. Although Lucifer is loyal to Lady Tremaine, like most cats, he has an independent streak. It might just be my interpretation, but in the climax when Cinderella is locked in her room while the mice try to save her, I don't see Lucifer's interference as necessarily being able to help his mistress. Throughout the movie, he's been targeting Gus for a meal, and he seems to be more focused on eating Gus than he is on stopping the mice from helping Cinderella. He's a little beast, but we can't get enough of him. Who doesn't love his excited freakout when he corners Gus under a cup? Lucifer's animator, Ward Kimball, apparently had trouble coming up with a proper design for the unpleasant feline. Walt Disney, while visiting Ward's house, pointed at Ward's own fat cat and said he had the perfect Lucifer all along. Lady Tremaine was voiced by Eleanor Audley, who gave a perfectly sinister performance. We'll be seeing Miss Audley again as Maleficent. Both of these villains have a similar look and aura, not to mention both their pets' names are synonymous with the devil. Lady Tremaine has Lucifer, Maleficent has Diablo the Raven. Drizella was voiced by Rhoda Williams. Anastasia was voiced by Lucille Bliss, who had a steady voice acting career beyond the movie. Among other roles, she was the longtime voice of Smurfette, and she memorably voiced Miss Bitters in Invader Zim. Lucifer was voiced by the legendary June Foray, whose impressive voiceover career spanned for nearly 70 years. In previous videos, although I talked about other appearances of the villains beyond their movie, most of them were in theme parks, video games, or comics, many things that could be written off as fun asides. Cinderella is arguably the first movie I'm talking about that has become a real franchise in and of itself with multiple sequels. Disney, like many other big franchises, plays very fast and loose with continuity. What you consider to be canon and non-canon is ultimately up to you. I say just pick and choose what you like. At the end of the day, it's all fiction, and all in fun. The first sequel was released directly to video in 2002 as Cinderella 2 Dreams Come True. It wasn't really so much a sequel as it was three mini-stories loosely strung together. An animated series called Cinderella Stories had been planned previously, but the project was ultimately cancelled, and this movie was three of the proposed episodes. The segment of interest for this retrospective is the final one, An Uncommon Romance, where Anastasia falls in love with a baker. Not only is she unconfident about her appearance, but Lady Tremaine, being the social climber she is, does not approve of Anastasia dating a commoner. Never mind that the Tremaines are not financially stable themselves, of course. Although the stepsisters are still shown to childishly squabble with each other, we get to see a more vulnerable side to Anastasia. Despite constantly primping and being pushed by her mother to find a rich, handsome bachelor, when Anastasia actually falls in love, she has no idea what to say or do in the moment. She literally has to be taught to smile properly later on. Cinderella, wanting everyone to find some happiness, even someone who mistreated her for so long, decides to help. What would you know? You're beautiful. It's always been easy for you. Easy? That's not how I remember it. With the help of her stepsister, Anastasia is able to stand up to her mother and pursue an actual romance based on love, rather than wealth. Although Lady Tremaine backs down, she's probably low-key planning on how to casually ruin the baker's life and make it look like an accident. A new villain was also introduced here, the king's own spoiled cat, Pom Pom. She looks and acts just like Lucifer, meaning Cinderella's mice friends will never get much rest, no matter where they're living. In the second segment, Tall Tale, Jack is turned into a human by the fairy godmother. This does not deter Pom Pom from stalking him. 
In fact, in one of the only moments to get a real chuckle from me, we see her doing the math in her head that a mouse in a human's body is apparently the same as a swarm of mice. Delicious and filling. As a human, Jack is still afraid of cats. He even admits to himself that he shouldn't be, but I guess instincts run deep. That, and even though Pom Pom could not logically eat him, she's still dead set on trying, and she definitely leaves some unsightly wounds in the process. I can't totally blame Jack for still being terrified. While Lucifer was last seen in the first movie falling out of a very high tower, he apparently landed on his feet because he's back too. He, of course, develops feelings for Pom Pom, basically a gender-swapped version of himself. His infatuation even overrides his appetite for mice, and he agrees to stop chasing them if they help hook him up with Pom Pom. Unfortunately for the mice, Pom Pom still likes chasing them, and Lucifer is more than happy to join her once the mice have helped him out. They really shouldn't have been all that surprised. In this sequel, Lady Tremaine was voiced by Suzanne Blakesley, Drizella by Russie Taylor, Anastasia by Tress McNeil, and both Lucifer and Pom Pom by Frank Welker. All of them are incredibly talented voice artists who you've probably heard many times if you've watched even a handful of cartoons from the past 30 years or so. In 2007, a third installment was released, A Twist in Time. At a glance, the premise sounds insane. A year after the events of the first movie, Lady Tremaine steals the fairy godmother's magic wand and uses it to turn back time and make it look like Anastasia was the one the prince fell in love with. As odd and fanfiction-y as this sounds, it actually came together pretty nicely, and was surprisingly enjoyable in its own right. This movie expands on the Anastasia plot from the second one. Once again, Anastasia is shown as longing for romance and for someone to love her. She initially is excited to be with the prince because he's royalty, and it's what her controlling mother wants. Then, she genuinely falls for him when he acts nice to her, something her own family never does. But finally, Anastasia realizes that although she loves him, he truly loves Cinderella, not her. Heartbreaking as that is for her, Anastasia acts unselfishly at the end, helping to break Lady Tremaine's evil spell and being able to find real love with the baker once more. The King and Anastasia also develop a sweet bond, since Anastasia apparently looks and acts a bit like the King's own late wife. Thanks to Anastasia being able to develop actual kindness, her more clumsy, awkward mannerisms left over from the first movie seem a bit more endearing. Drizella, meanwhile, stays on the dark side. She does not get the redemption arc her sister does, and pretty much acts exactly the same as she did in the first two movies. Not that I'm complaining, since her scenes are still a lot of fun. Also on display in this movie is the messed up Tremaine family dynamics. Without Cinderella around as a scapegoat, the family has turned on each other. Although it was hinted at in the first movie, it's even more clear in this one that Lady Tremaine does not really love her daughters. She sees them as tools, the means to an end. Although she showers them with high fashion, although she magically gives them a chance to live as royalty, she's never actually kind or caring to them. She never acts as an actual loving parent, and Anastasia waking up to this is what helps prompt her to ultimately do the right thing. Some might say that giving Lady Tremaine a magic wand and making her a more traditional villain is ruining the realness her character had in the first movie, but I disagree. We've already seen just how evil she can be without any outside help, so I like the extension of her character here. Everything she does to ruin Cinderella's happiness in the third movie is something she would have done in a heartbeat in the first one if she was able. She's the same villainess as before, she just happens to have gotten her hands on something that makes her more dangerous. And most satisfying of all, she gets a healthy dose of karma. At the end of the first movie, all we see is her brief outrage expression when Cinderella gets the happy ending. Most of this was for pacing reasons. The ending of the movie goes by very quickly, but it's timed out perfectly. They had planned a longer ending with the prince and Cinderella meeting again before the wedding, but it reportedly killed the pacing of the movie. Similarly, it's hard to imagine seeing the Tremaines receive comeuppance in a way that wouldn't ruin the mood of the happy ending. I don't think we want to see Cinderella's bird friends peck the stepsister's eyes out, for example. But at the same time, the Tremaines were so easy to hate in the first movie that you want to imagine something happening. In Twist in Time, it's brief, but we see Lady Tremaine and Rizella get turned into frogs, and then maids, wearing Cinderella's own old clothes. Most likely, though, they'll get a worse punishment later on. They basically committed treason, and although Cinderella is the sweet forgiving type, the king seems like he's much less so. There's some more great material with Lucifer here, too. In one scene, the mice use the wand to shrink him down to minuscule size, even smaller than them. 
Unfortunately, a tiny Lucifer manages to be just as bloodthirsty as a normal-sized one. Lady Tremaine uses the wand to turn him into a scuzzy-looking human near the end. Human Lucifer drives Cinderella around in a parody of her own pumpkin coach, apparently planning to kill her. Most amusingly, even as a human, he can't resist trying to eat Gus. Like I said, those instincts run deep. The voice cast from the second movie returns as the villains, with Leslie Margarita providing Anastasia's singing voice. In the 2015 live-action remake, Lady Tremaine is played by Kate Blanchett, who gets top billing, Anastasia by Holiday Granger, and Rizella by Sophia McShira. More emphasis is put on how and why Lady Tremaine acts so awful, her bitterness largely stemming from losing both her husbands. The Grand Duke, who was a funny, sympathetic character in animation, is now an antagonist as well, played by Stellan Skarsgård. He cares more about obtaining power for the kingdom through an arranged marriage than he does in indulging the prince's search for a mystery woman. He is eventually forced to form an alliance with Lady Tremaine, who overhears him plotting. You've spared the kingdom a great deal of embarrassment. And I should like to keep it that way. Are you threatening me? Yes. In the Once Upon a Time series, we saw two versions of the Wicked Stepmother character. Lady Tremaine is played by Jane Brandle Smith in Season 1, and Lisa Baines in Season 6. The seventh season had Rapunzel playing the stepmother role, with Anastasia and Drizella being her daughters. This version was played by Gabrielle Anwar. Drizella, who joined her mother as one of the season's main antagonists, was played by Adelaide Kane, and Anastasia by Yale Yerman. In the Descendants series, one of the villain's children is Dizzy Tremaine, Drizella's daughter, played by Anna Cathcart. Her grandmother, Lady Tremaine, also appears, played by Linda Coe. Two cats bearing a striking resemblance to Lucifer appeared in an episode of Disney's TV anthology series. They were featured in an extended version of the Ben and Me short, where they were shown plaguing ancestors of the short's narrator, Amos. One of them is identified as a female cat named Elizabeth. Before Cinderella hit theaters, Disney actually had another cat named Lucifer appear in a pair of 1946 cartoons. In Bath Day and Pluto's Kid Brother, this nasty alley cat caused a good amount of grief for Figaro, Pluto, and Pluto's kid brother. He didn't last very long, and later Pluto cartoons pitted Pluto against a cuter, slightly more likable cat named Milton. Sadly, Milton didn't stick around for that much longer. Disney comics have rarely focused much on the humans in Cinderella, preferring to follow the exploits of Jack, Gus, and Lucifer. In most of his comic appearances, Lucifer is colored bright orange for some reason. Perhaps someone thought it literally looked better on paper, but I prefer the black and gray colors. One Lucifer story has him trick Tinkerbell into helping him fly into the castle so he could chase Jack and Gus. This is the only comic I've found where he has the ability to talk. Another story has Pluto try to behave himself and act nice to cats, in hopes of getting a new doghouse for Christmas. Lucifer, who apparently lives nearby in this story, takes full advantage of this and abuses Pluto without fear of repercussion. Obliviously, Mickey gets Pluto the doghouse, with an addition built on for his good playmate, Lucifer. An especially odd Lucifer story has Scrooge McDuck trying to corner the market on cats. This is an early appearance of Scrooge, meaning he's significantly nastier than he became later on. Still, if anyone is going to corner the market on an entire species, it's Scrooge. As a test of how good his cats will be at catching mice, he unleashes Lucifer on Jack and Gus, who are living with Grandma Duck in this continuity. Lucifer is able to catch Jack, but Scrooge is horrified when dim-witted Gus is able to outsmart Lucifer. His plans for a cat monopoly are immediately halted. This brings us to the most obscure Cinderella villain. In 1950, to promote Cinderella's release, Jack and Gus appeared in an extended story arc in the Mickey Mouse newspaper comic. They're the same size as Mickey here, and they live in a far-off kingdom of mice that is plagued by a mysterious tyrant called the Iron Mask. He was apparently voted into office by the citizens, but executing anyone who voted against him probably helped sway things in his favor. Mickey is asked to help free the kingdom, but is quickly caught by Iron Mask's henchmen, who look like a cross between Mortimer Mouse and the Weasels. Mickey is forced to be a jester for the cruel king, while simultaneously acting as a Robin Hood-style freedom fighter. Eventually, Iron Mask is revealed to be much smaller outside his elaborate costume. He's a sniveling little shrimp of a mouse who claims that he took on the Iron Mask persona after he was bullied because of his size. Of course, as the Iron Mask, he became a worse bully than ever, executing mass numbers of mice for no reason other than to instill fear. Needless to say, Mickey does not find the true Iron Mask to be terribly sympathetic. Jack and Gus become the new leaders, 
and are presumably much better at their job. In video games related to Cinderella, Lucifer is once again featured the most out of the villains. In the Game Boy Advance Disney Princess game, he follows Cinderella throughout her level, slowing down her cleaning by leaving paw prints everywhere, much like he did in the movie. Cinderella can give him a swat with her broom, but she'll get in trouble if she does it while Lady Tremaine is nearby. In another Game Boy Advance game, Cinderella Magical Dreams, Lucifer is a boss that the mice have to fight twice. First when collecting materials for Cindy's dress, and again at the end when trying to rescue Cinderella from the tower. In the Wii game, Disney Princess My Fairy Tale Adventure, the player must creep by a sleeping Lucifer in what amounts to an incredibly basic stealth section of the level. The most significant video game appearance of all the Cinderella villains was in Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. First, one of the playable characters, Ventus, has to fight Lucifer. Unfortunately, Ventus has been shrunk to the size of a mouse, making the battle harder than fighting a cat normally would be. Later, the scene with the Duke putting the glass slipper on Cinderella's foot is reenacted. However, in this game, the darkness and anger in one's heart can manifest monstrous creatures called the Unversed. Lady Tremaine creates an Unversed pumpkin coach to attack Cinderella as soon as she leaves the chateau. The coach, among other attacks, throws Green Goblin-style pumpkin bombs. A stray bomb ends up exploding on the three Tremaines as they gloat, effectively killing them. <laughs> this is what happens when you go against my wishes. The darkness in their hearts overtook them. It's not quite getting their eyes pecked out by birds, but I'll take it. In this game, Suzanne Blakesley and Russie Taylor once again voiced Lady Tremaine and Drizella, while Gina Tuttle voiced Anastasia and John Olson voiced Lucifer. In the Disney theme parks, there aren't many attractions that feature the Tremaines too heavily. Cinderella isn't really the kind of movie that inspires a ride, and the walkthrough attractions and carousels only have a few small references to the villains that aren't really of much note. Over on the Disney cruise ship, though, an interesting stage show premiered in 2005 called Twice Charmed. This one picks up right after the first movie, and shows the bitter Tremaine family visited by their own wicked fairy godfather, Franco de Fortunato. Just like Cinderella's fairy godmother appeared in The Girl's Greatest Time of Need, Franco has come to reverse the fortunes of the Tremaines. He turns back time to prevent Cinderella from being found as the mystery girl who fits the slipper, instead making it so Anastasia or Drizella has a chance as the prince's bride. If this sounds a lot like A Twist in Time, there is definitely a link between the show and the sequel that came out a couple years later. In fact, the team that wrote the songs and book for the show, Alan Zachary and Michael Weiner, also wrote the songs for A Twist in Time. I'm not sure if the stage show inspired the sequel, or if they are being developed around the same time, but there's undoubtedly a connection. In fact, a revamped version of the show premiered in 2016 that had the plot slightly altered to make it a little closer to the movie sequel and incorporate one of the sequel songs. Franco is a wonderful inverse of the fairy godmother. She is a sweet, unassuming old woman. He is a flashy, in-your-face showman. She gives Cinderella a temporary gift free of charge. He offers a long-lasting gift, but with a catch. If Cinderella is still able to find a happy ending, the Tremaines will be Franco's slaves. Lady Tremaine may be petty and power-hungry as they come, but she's smart enough to know that it's not worth such a risk. But this is a musical, and in true Broadway fashion, all it takes is a snazzy dance number to change her mind. Franco and the Tremaine's catchy song, It's Never Too Late, is arguably the only true villain song the characters have ever had in the entire franchise. Over the course of the show, Franco turns back time, shrinks Cinderella to the size of a mouse, makes it so the shoe fits Anastasia, hypnotizes the prince to fall in love with Anastasia, and yet Cinderella is still able to prevail, meaning the Tremaines are Franco's slaves for life, their last seen dragging off his huge bags of laundry. Throughout the franchise, the Tremaines have been truly awful, despicable characters, minus Anastasia in the sequels. All that being said, at the theme parks, they're a riot. While I did say that they aren't emphasized in any attractions, they are often seen as meetable characters. If you have a chance to say hello to them, by all means do. They're hysterically funny, and it's easy to forget how much you may have hated them in their movie when you're watching their antics in person. While I was working at the parks, I liked to visit the characters on my days off, and I love drawing things for them. For Lady Tremaine, I drew Lucifer. For Anastasia, I drew the Baker. And for Drizella, I drew her own imaginary dream man, who accidentally ended up looking a little bit like a young Walt Disney, come to think of it. Early versions of the terrain costumes were kind of horrifying, with them wearing large masks. 
I'm not sure why this was ever seen as a good idea, but I've only found a couple undated photos with this design, so hopefully it didn't last very long. Lucifer, to my knowledge, never appeared as a meetable character in the parks, but I found a few photos of him as a walk around in an Ice Capades show. For one final story before we bring this to a close, as long as we're talking about Lucifer and theme parks, I had a friend who worked with me at Disney World, uh, I was a character attendant and she was a photographer, and she had a large Lucifer plush that she loved. She had told me a story about how after she was recovering from a surgery, she had asked her mother to bring her her plush to hold. The nurses had overheard her repeatedly asking for someone to bring Lucifer to her, and they were sufficiently creeped out. Disney's Cinderella was a smash success upon release, and its profits gave the company the funds needed for more animated features. That will take us to our next entry, where we'll be looking at the mad villains down the rabbit hole in Wonderland. So plant some red roses, hold on to your heads, and I'll see you then.